Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, we're going to continue our study on putting Jeroboam on a line. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for all the things you do in our lives and for the time that we have to open your word together and to search for um, truths that can bring conviction and power to our lives. It can actually uh, transform us. We ask for light for our feet that we can be obedient to the light that you give. We pray for each person. We pray for the plans for the camp meeting. And we ask, Lord, that um, we can draw closer to you and to each other. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. So uh, this study here in in taking judges and placing this on a line that we named Jeroboam is um, what we are going to try to finish off today. Now, uh, in this study of Jeroboam, we had we had marked the time of the end. Uh, this was with Dwight's suggestion of, of these verses, 612. And 612 is going to be where um, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Gideon. And, and then in 622, uh, when Gideon perceived that it was an angel of the Lord, that's going to be uh, the formalization of the message. And then 632 is where uh, he has a name change. So his name is going to be called Jeroboam. And so this is the line of Jeroboam. And what we're looking at here in trying to understand this line is, um, I'll show you here. is specifically what is the darkness, why this line of Jeroboam. And we know that this, this darkness has to, so this is going to be a message to FFA. We know that the Midianites, they, they represent strife, conflict. And, and so in some of our lines, the, the conflict is the internal conflict that goes on. Um, but here there's, there's more to it in this line of Jeroboam because this has to do with, uh, in this message, this part of Jeroboam, the focus here, because he's called Jeroboam, let Baal plead, has to do with this destruction of this altar, this altar to Baal. And so this darkness here would be, um, uh, and we, we've tried to characterize it, We've tried to give some sort of definitive way of, of understanding this darkness and this message. So we know the next message is going to be this message about Nashville. And when we looked at Nashville, we could see that um, this altar of Baal represents, uh, just like Nashville, um, this false system of education. And that what's being applied here in, in this history um, is, is Miller's rules that's going to give us this July 18, 2020 date. And this July 18, 2020 date, it's obviously in response to, to some degree, especially in the story of Gideon, as Jeff had laid out, uh, this date that represents this movement, July 18, as opposed to the Omega that had November 9th, 2019 as their date. And so Jeff characterized it in different ways. He used, of course, the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel, but he also used this story of Gideon. Now, in this part of the story, the focus is not so much upon uh, the battle with the 300. This this part of the story, this, this line, is addressing... Um, 
this system of education or study. And we're going to see that there's going to be this first message. And obviously, when the second angel's, angel's message arrives on July 8, July 19th, so after the failure of the Nashville prediction, what we have on this line is this uh the second message relates to the first message. So if you haven't benefited from the first, you can't be benefited from the second. And we know that once we start after July 18th, we start an examination of our message. That is, we start searching for why the event did not occur. Now, we have an, an answer to that on July 19th. But that's not well accepted within the movement. And that's going to be rejected on December 6, 2020. So FFA is going to reject that. And then we're going to have this uh, empowerment of July 18th and how we study um, on December 25th, 2020, when the bombing of Nashville occurs and we see that the 187 days that occur from June 21st, June 22nd, depending how it's counted, um, is an affirmation that we were correct, that to name Nashville was not wrong. Now, we know that the event that we predicted will still occur. Um, and then we have the December 25th, 2021 date, this a new message arriving. And that message relates to the 777 years. And, and these start to become intertwined with each other. The, the understanding of these lines and the different messages. So it's sometimes difficult to take one of these threads out of this garment and, and examine it and to understand its place and its purpose. So, I mean, I think that's the great difficulty we have in looking at these lines is we see so many symbols um, and so many events in our history that can be represented, but to correctly pick these and place them on a line, it's not that easy. And, and the main way we do that is we, we define what these messages are. What are the situations? Why are these dates uh, significant? Okay. Now, we also had looked at that there's two different groups. And we did this with other, the other lines as well. We have other lines of these 777 days where we have FFA and the remnant of FFA are the two groups. Um, so they're being tested, though, with different messages. That is, um, when we talk about a, uh, a message, it's in response to darkness. And there are different types of darknesses that, that this movement has to address, that every reform line has to address and these uh, these come about as the fact that once you once you get light and people start responding to a message the darkness doesn't disappear the light is going to address certain things but as we we get this advancing light that light shines into the darkness further right and that darkness becomes more well defined so in Millerite history, you know, we have papal darkness, right? I mean, that's a very broad thing. We, we can label all kinds of aspects that are papal darkness. Um, but the main aspect that Miller's line addresses is a prophetic message about the papacy. Right? And that's what's going to be tested. And that's why we have this message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. When the second an angel arrives because the protestant churches have now uh they now constitute babylon and, and that that's not true in 1798 right so as you have these messages uh, arrive people respond to a message and and not all that response is is accepting of the message some of them go into deeper darkness and so we can have another message arrive. And we know that each of these way marks uh, can be a line in, in and of itself. And so they have to have a period of darkness. Now, sometimes that will be connected with, because they'll start at the time of the end. Um, so they can be connected with that main 
darkness in the, the larger reform line. Um, but sometimes that darkness is something that occurs within the movement itself. And that's addressed. That, that wasn't really there before. I mean, it was there, but not as well defined because people are making choices. Okay. So, so what is this darkness? We've talked about it before. We've given different descriptions of it. And, I, and I've given a description of it here. But what's, what's the best way? How would you understand the darkness that, was, that, that is being addressed by Jeru Bale? Let Bale plead. So if somebody can sort of put that in their own words. Could you restate that question, please? Okay, so I want you to, to describe what this darkness is that this line of Jeroboam addresses. When, we, when we're at the time of the end, we've, we've talked about the fact that it's, it has to do with education, right? How we study God's word. But what's, what's the best way to describe the darkness? In, in your own words, if somebody could, not just in a phrase, but just sort of how we understand this. Isn't it more the misapprehension that we've had of what Scripture says because of the type of education that has crept within the church? Okay. And within the movement. Exactly. So, so when we think about the type of education, um, often what we do as conservatives Conservative Adventists is we just talk about worldly education, universities, colleges, right? To us, that's something that someone else does, and so it doesn't it doesn't affect us. They're the ones who are in error in how they study, and and we study correctly. That's generally how it would be characterized, correct? Right. But we know that this is something within this movement itself. And it's not a battle against the educated and the uneducated. Right? Because there is a problem with our, our understanding. Because we're affected by the world. None of us can say that we, we're not affected by the education of the world. Right. So if we look at the characterization, because I've been reading lots in the spirit of prophecy about this, what are the principles that exist in this worldly education that are manifest in this movement, even though it's we're not talking about, uh, you know, educated ministers with university degrees, doctorates and things like that? So what is this darkness then if we're gonna if we're gonna try to narrow it down within this movement? So we know it has to do with education, man's method of study. How are we affected by that? What is it that man's method of study produces? Man's method of, me of study produces almost a wall between us and God. Okay, what is that wall then? What, why does it create this wall? What does it do to us? It lifts up, it lifts up self. Okay. So, and we can see that when we looked at July 18th, when we looked at this movement, when we look at ourselves, we can see that self is there. Self is exalted. This dependence upon self, but also seeking to have self vindicated. Right. Looking to man, looking for man's approbation. Right. Correct. Status, place. Now, 
See, the thing is, Seventh-day Adventists who are conservative often think that they're immune to this. But often they manifest it uh, in ways that they're un that they're not aware of, that they can't see. So they can boast about the fact that they're not educated. All right. But they can think, well, you know, I'm not like those people are who have these degrees and all this. You know, I just, I just, you know, I'm a, you know, trust the Bible, right? We can say that. But often our approach to studying the Bible is to exalt self. We can actually be very, very proud of our biblical knowledge as, as we uh, see it, when we can be extremely ignorant of God's word. And, and I'm sure all of us have seen people or individuals who are ignorant of God's word, but yet believe themselves to be teachers. Right? You know, we, we see this all the time. Now, obviously, we don't see this in ourselves, right? I mean, that's somebody else. But the reality is we're not that different. We can be proud of our ignorance. That is, we can still be operating on the same principles of worldly education, even though we don't have a worldly education, per se. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, so, so it is something that we have to um, we have to recognize in ourselves and that's not easy to do you know especially often we've been blessed with a great deal of light and it can make us feel like we are superior to those who haven't been blessed with this light but it's not the light that we've been blessed with that makes the difference. It's whether we accept that light and walk in it, whether that light does its work, right? So in a reform line is, you know, developing and demonstrating two classes of worshipers in this three-step testing prophetic message. And so no matter how much we know, how studied we are, there is no surety that, that we are going to be preserved because if we reject that light, the work that the light wants to do upon us in changing our character, it doesn't matter how much we intellectually understand it. It matters whether it does that work in us. And that work is going to make us dependent upon God and not dependent upon self. So, so we know that there is an education, and, and we looked at Parminder's ideals, right? You need to go to good schools, have good teachers, and, and then once you're taught, you know, you'll know how to use the rules and the principles, and then you will agree with your teachers. So basically, once you've been brainwashed, you know, we don't need to worry about you. You don't have to listen to us because you've already been programmed, so, so we don't need to worry, right? And so we can look at that and we can look at that sort of, well, we're not like that. But within this movement, it, it's quite clear that to a large degree, uh, we're we, we are following men, right? People want somebody to look to. And, and that's why this, this idea that we see, and I was reading about it in uh, Five Testimonies, Heidi and I, over the last few days. Um reading about the fact that uh, when somebody uh, flatters somebody or praises them or uplifts man in some way, um, this is extremely dangerous because all of this light that this movement has been given hasn't come from man, right? Even though we are his agents and we can say that, you know, I found this truth, I noticed this, whatever we studied and found, we found these precious gems. Well, those precious gems could not be found if God had not dug them up for us, so to speak. I mean, 
They need to be found. They're found at the right time. Um, yeah, and as uh, you know, Angela points out, we must have this encounter with God, as did Gideon in Judges 6.22. Um, on witnessing, she writes, on witnessing the angel's actions, he recognized his own frailty, sinfulness, mortality. He was awestruck. Uh, Jeff Pippinger often spoke of the necessity of laying human pride in the dust when we come face to face with death or face to face with Christ. And, and so none of this, none of these things that we study are meant to vindicate us or our own ideas of ourselves or exalt us or make us, um, you know, to gain the admiration of our peers or anything like that. This is to humble human pride. And so when we look at these lines, we look at this line particularly with Jeroboam, it's this tearing down of this altar. Now, we said, well, it's going to be, you know, this Athena, you know, in Nashville, Tennessee, the symbol of this, this education uh, system that exalts man. And yet that's something that had to be tear down, torn down in this movement. Right. Agreed. And and, and in, in us. So the thing that we're ignorant of, the thing that this darkness is, is our lack of understanding of truth, that we're, we're not aware of it. We're not aware of our own uh, inability to study God's word. We're not aware that these truths come from God. Now, an example outside of us particularly, but within this movement, was Tabo. Now, I was friends with Tabo. You know, he, uh, he lived with me for a while, and he was uh, the leader here in Canada, uh, Future News Canada. And um, he had this issue with where light was coming from. So for him... He believed that all of the light that was coming to the movement was coming from Africa. You know, we had blessings and some other people studying there in Africa. And that's good. You know, the light isn't just coming from Arkansas, from Jeff. That was one of the signs that this was a movement led by God. But does it really matter where the light came from? Whether it was Africa or Arkansas or some other country, does it really matter? Because it all comes from God. And, and to be sort of proud that it's coming from Africa, I understand national pride to some degree, even though I'm a Canadian. I um, understand that it exists. And, and, you know, we can sometimes be proud of where we came from. But if we're going to say, you know, it came from this place or from this person, this person found this truth. Well, God could have chose anyone, right? He could ch chose any place on this earth. And he, he chooses based upon his criteria, which isn't man's criteria. He doesn't choose the great men of the world. Right? So this darkness has to do with education. But we can see that this is something that exists within us. And this is self-exaltation. This becomes this competition. And it's not a competition. Right? It's not, we are not to be striving to, against each other. We should be striving against sin. Okay. So, so we have this darkness. Now we have this message that arrives November 9th, 2019. Now, we have the verse 612, and that just simply says that this angel, right, this angel of the Lord, um, comes and appears to, to Gideon, right? Now, it comes to Gideon while he's threshing, threshing wheat, right, by the wine press. So this message of Gideon comes from the threshing of wheat and 
by the wine press, which represents doctrine. So both of these represent doctrine. And we can see that, that that's happening there in this period of darkness. And we're saying November 9th, 2019. Now, now we have that date there. You know, we we could put other dates there. I mean, there are other dates connected with November 9th, but other lines sort of bring those dates out. So we're just saying that it's at that point that something happens in this movement. Now, we know that there's the 777 uh, uh, structure that's going to be understood later. But it's going it's to show us that there's 777 days from September 23rd, 2017 to November 9th, 2019. And... But in that period of time, in all that those things that happened, and we have September 7th, 2019, uh, we're marking November 9th. So what's the reason for doing that? Again, why are we choosing that? So even though we have 612 there, uh, 612 and 611 go together, right? So we remember what we did with verse 6, or verse 11 in chapter 6. There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Oprah, that pertaineth unto Joash, the Abazarite, and his son Gideon, thresh wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So, so this is really uh, 6.11 and 6.12. Right? But we just put 612 there for simplicity's sake. Correct. Okay. So um, so one of the ways we could do this is we put six. I'm, I'm going to do it like this. Um, no, oops. Didn't want to do that. 611, 612. Um, oops. I'm going to do it like this. Yeah. And then one, I think that there is 611. Okay, so 611 means 11.9. That's what I'm doing there. And then 612 is that verse <clears throat> that we're going to mark. Okay. Okay. So in, in this situation. Yeah. Okay. We're looking at this specifically because we have, as it says in scripture, the angel of the Lord coming to Gideon. Mm-hmm. Now, as we compare Scripture with Scripture, yeah, and as we had addressed in the prior study, who is this angel of the Lord? Well, it's Christ. Right. So here's Gideon. He's given a, basically, the appearance is, the face-to-face -face with Christ, right? Yeah. So Gideon, like Ezekiel, like Daniel, and like John, comes face-to-face -face with Christ regarding what is going to have to happen in defense of his people. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't this the, the position that we find ourselves in at this time? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, in, in some ways that, that continually happens in our conversion process as we move through time. I, I agree it happens in the conversion process, but my question is more to the preparation for 
the work that needs to be done. Right. Yeah. So, so as we move through each of these waymarks, each of these waymarks in some ways, because all of them are reform lines, they, they have to have a revelation of Christ. Now this one here at 11, nine, um, is, uh, because this was a date that many people saw as a close of probation, right? Where let him that is righteous be righteous still, still try, type of close of probation. So they're expecting to be without sin. And of course, that was a delusion, right? I mean, that was obviously fanaticism to believe that, but people believe that. Now, that would, of course, been quite opposite to the idea of what was what this line represents, Right, because this line is not representing a close of probation where let him and his righteous be righteous still, but the beginning of a reform line, right? <laughs> now, of course, every waymark can have a reform line attached to it. But right. The point is, this, this event to this movement was meant to be an arrival of a message that addressed the, one of the major problems within the movement. That is dependence upon man. So many people in this movement, the reason why they ended up following Parminder's movement is they were just looking for a leader. They were just looking for somebody to tell them what to do. Right. Some, so that they didn't have to take the individual responsibility for their decisions. And, and they'd been following Jeff. Right. So when Jeff handed over the, the cloak to Parminder, well, they were happy to follow Parminder. Didn't really matter, you know, who it was, just as long as it was everybody was sort of following that. So they're going to go with the majority. And there was lots that happened in the movement that, that weeded out other people that maybe would have stood up to Parminder. But Parminder had ways of, of dealing with those people because some of them had character defects that he could he could um, uh, use. Yeah, well, manipulate. There's another word for it. I can't think of it, but uh, utilize anyway. He could use those those character defects for their undoing. And um, so. So when we get to this, what's that? So, so in other words, he could employ those character defects for their own undoing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we saw this happen lots through this movement. Satan had people that, you know, if they had patiently endured whatever it was that they were facing, God could have used them. But instead, the weaknesses of their character were shown once they were put in, in various types of situations, sometimes just being praised was enough to, to undo them, right? But the point is, we now had this, this new message, and we have all these people following this message, much less than we had before, but the faithful who didn't follow Parminder. And we have an increase of knowledge. This is the message of July 18, and then it... It comes to this publication in Nashville. So we have there um, two different things. We have Judges 6.21 and Judges 6.22. Now, we put Judges 6.22 there. But if we look at 6.21, the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh of the unleavened cakes and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of their sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord, my God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. So in this act of what happens, uh, we're going to see this formalization of the message. And this formalization of the message then we can say at 621 to 622, right? Not just 622, 
And that's going to match up with June 21st and June 22nd. And, and why would we say that this, this offering being accepted, is that in any way connected with the publication of the Nashville warning in any symbolic way? Is this an offering? In a put, manner of speaking. Yeah. So, and we put the ad in and was it accepted by God? I would believe yes. Yeah. The money was returned, right? We, we saw God's blessing upon publishing of that ad. And then... Um, it's going to also be witness witness later with the December 25th, 2020 uh, bombing of Nashville. So, so it's going to be connected with this, this offering in a sense being accepted, but it's connected later. Um, but we should have seen in, in what happened that, that we, uh, we saw God's face. We recognize God's hand in this message of July 18th, right? So it's a formalization of the message. The message, of course, is formalized in the sense it's put together, right? It's right there um, in publication form. And often a formalization has to do with the publication of something. So we know in our line, 1989, the formalization is the time of the end magazine, right? In 1996. And so... Here's another publication of Jeff's. Now, of course, the website gets up earlier than, than this, but we have the website up. We publish, and it's even on the Wednesday previous, they do an ad advertising the website. But here we would have to look at uh, this ad in the Tennessean that causes this ruckus uh, as really um, the four formalization of that message, right? People hear about it. And we have that with Miller too. I mean, you could look at, uh, instead of uh, 1833, you could say, well, it's 1831 when he first began to preach. And with Jeff, you could have 1993 uh, when he publishes uh, the paper on prophetic lines. So, so in each of these, there's kind of uh, a precursor to it. But then we see on July 18th, the renaming in this way, Mark, we're taking 632, the renaming of Gideon to Jeroboam, right? Let Baal plead. And so we're saying that that's the empowerment of that first message. So again, we have this, this um, and remember the Tennessee, and because obviously this is all connected to to Nashville, and we publish it in the Tennessee in itself. So it's not just some newspaper. It's a newspaper called the Tennessee. Um, then we get to July 18th, and this, this prediction fails. Now, Jeroboam is, or Gideon's renamed as Jeroboam because of the tearing down of the altar and what his father says about him. So this in response to those who want to have Gideon's head, so to speak, right? They want to kill him. But, you know, Baal, can't Baal plead for himself? So how does this relate to July 18, 2020, this verse? So the verse itself, in verse 32, says, just therefore that day he called him Jeroboam, saying, let Baal plead against him because he hath thrown down his altar. So this is going to be his dad, Right. Joash, who's going to rename him as right. Jeroboam. And uh, so we have this name change. We say that that's going to be on the empowerment of the first angel's message. Now, we know this is this tearing down of the, the altar that, that results in this. He cuts down the grove beside it as well. Um. So how do we put this at July 18th? Are we just arbitrarily placing this? Is there uh, something else? Because we're, we're putting that date there, but why? Based on what reason? Now, 
before we had June 27th, right? So I changed it to July 18th. And Are we not looking at it with July 18th because this warning message given as it was went out to the entire world so that they became aware of the fact that an event was soon to occur. Okay. Yeah. But we have July 18th as the empowerment of that and nothing happened. Are we not then repeating exactly the portion of Millerite history that occurred by October 22nd, 1822 or 1844? Okay, so so one of the things we did is we, we initially said that's October 22, 1844, right? It's our disappointment. Now, if we looked at this way, Mark, though, in the context of Millerite history, that would be August 11th. 1840. 40. Now, of course, that's going to be uh, 15 days after the 26th day of the fourth month. This is obviously the 26th day of the fourth month right? in, in, in 2020. So we have that, that symbol there. Um, So how can we connect this to July 18th? How is in what steps could we use or what yeah. events? What, what symbols can we use that we find here in this verse? Um, you know, anything in the verse, the verse number for itself, 632, is there anything there? Well, <clears throat> okay. You have a what looks to be a name change or an ironic comment of a name change. Right. Let bail plead. Now, um, but they're, all, they're also recognizing that Gideon had, had destroyed the altar of Baal. Right. Now, now we know this is, this was about Islam. That's the way that we approach this. Now is 632 AD in any way connected with biblical prophecy. I would have to say yes. Okay, so what happens in 632 AD? Stephen? You're, you're all muffled, Stephen. I, I can't actually hear you. I think I know what you're probably saying, but you're muffled. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Barely. I, I can hear you to know that you said, can you hear me? I'm not sure why why I'm having so much trouble hearing you. So Angela put in the death of Muhammad. So that's true. So we have the death of Muhammad and what else? Abu Abu Bakr's command. Is that of prophetic significance? Yes, because Abu Bakr becomes the, the caliph after mm -hmm. Muhammad dies. Yeah, the successor. Right. So he becomes the successor of Muhammad, right? And he's going to give this command. 
right? And this command is connected with. If it's a tab, if they go to cat, cat start with, I'm sorry. <laughs> Cat tapping over, which he's the one that takes over the, the city. Okay, I'm not sure what you're saying. So we know the first 150 years begins, right? There's two periods of 150 years. Um, I can just show you a simple chart here. So we have Muhammad's um, uh, imposture on 606, right? And and then Muhammad's going to flee from uh, Mecca to Medina. Or, yeah, so that's going to happen in 622. But 10 years later, he's going to die. And Abu Bakr's command is going to initiate the first period of 150 years, 632 to 782 AD, right? And then you're going to have um, another 150 years, right? July 27th, 1299 to July 27th, 1449, Gregorian in that case. And then the 351 years and 15 days from the 27th, 1299. Yeah, so, so um, and then you have the 391 years, as you can see there, right? So the point is 632 represents Abu Bakr's command, which is uh, sometimes used as the date. I, I think Uriah Smith uses that as the date, as the beginning of uh, the, the trumpet, the, the fifth trumpet. But be that as it may, we know it's significant because it's the 150 years, the first period of 150 years, the first period of five months that's mentioned in Revelation 9. Um, so this 632, we can see that connection there. Now, is that just an arbitrary connection? Is it just some kind of coincidence that, uh, that we put there? Or is it significant that we have that uh, symbol of the empowerment of the first angel's message, having that verse? And we can see that there's a name change there, too, in a sense. It goes from Muhammad to Abu Bakr. I mean, right. it's not the same individual, but there is a change that occurs there in 632. Don't he, don't he take down the walls with a cannon? No, that's that's a lot, lot later. That's going to be uh, 14, um, 1453. You're looking at the way mark there. That would be four years after 1449. So Abu Bakr gives this command to to not hurt, or or, or to hurt, you know, no, hurt not, don't kill basically the Sabbath keepers, right? So that's why we have July 18th, 632. We can see that this relates to uh, 632 AD. Now, even here, um, this also can relate to Islam. You know, this is 622 AD, right? Whoops, can't capitalize numbers. The 622 AD, of course, is this is where the Islamic calendar begins on July 18th on the Gregorian calendar, right? It's going to be July 18th at sunset, right? Um, now, we know the 622, that's a symbol of FFA, of course, and uh, we know that 622, that's going to be um, connected with... Uh, uh, the birth of Enoch, I believe. It's also 622 BC. Um, and what's 622 BC? People remember? 
So you got 622 AM, 622 BC to 622 AD. So what's the BC one? Okay, so Stephen said something, but uh, it's going to be um, the Passover of, of uh, Josiah is in 622. Right, so, so you have Josiah connected there. <clears throat> so the, anyway, we have 622. The symbol of FFA is there at this formalization when FFA publishes this announcement regarding Nashville. And this goes worldwide on, well, they publish it on June 21st and it goes international on June 22nd. And that's going to be 187 days to December 25th. And then, so we have July 18th, 632. And now we have July 19th. So this is an arrival of a new message. And so many people leave the movement after July 18th. There's some people we never hear from again, people who were, you know, watching the studies, supporting everything that was happening. When July 18th happens, uh, lots of people leave the movement immediately. They, they don't want to have anything to do with it. But we do have um, a, a group of people who are running things uh, who also reject July 18th because they're embarrassed, one of the main reasons. Um, but they're going to make this uh, imposture. We'll, we'll just line it up with the imposture of Muhammad. But they make this imposture that we're going to go through and look at this and evaluate it openly and fairly as a movement. And, of course, uh, the conclusion is, is already um, uh, planned in advance. They know what their conclusion is. So... Their hand is sort of forced, though, to show that on December 6, 2020. So December 26, you have this. Uh, uh, again, you have a 6-12, uh, right? Okay. So Pentecost begins tonight. Um, I'm just looking in the chat there. Um Yeah, so Pentecost is tomorrow, is what she's saying. Um, and and right now it's 525, so it's May 25th at sunset. Pentecost begins. I don't know if, if that's relevant to what we're talking about right now, but that is, is interesting. It's a symbol of a 252. <clears throat> Okay, so um, so getting back to this here, um, we have this 364. So 364, um, this is going to be this trumpet. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, he blew the trumpet, and Ebenezer was gathered after him, the father of help. So we would say that that God comes and helps this movement at the time of our disappointment. Right. So we have an answer to our disappointment being given on July 19th. But many people refuse. That's why I put the word with the double meaning there, refuse and refuse. Um, marking that second group of people. So it's the remnant of FFA. Right. We have a remnant that's being tested. In Millerite history, it was Protestants and Millerites, Seventh-day Adventists and Levites in our history. But here in this line, internally, it's FFA and those that refuse. There's that refuse. So some are refused. Some refuse the message and some are refused. So they become refused. Okay. Um. So 634, this trumpet, how was this trumpet, July 19th, 
how does this relate to this verse and to this date, July 19th? Because he's going to send out messengers, right? Throughout all Manasseh, unto Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, right? So we know if we take all of these, Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, all four um, wives of Jacob are going to be represented, right? So Pa, Bilha, and Rachel and Leah, right? So this is the, you know, it's representing though within each of those uh, the least, right? Correct. Okay. So it's another reason why I'm saying that this is a group that's being represented. So we're going to mark it there. So, I mean, we could say it's 634 and 635, right? But I'm just putting it there, 634. But it's it includes that verse. Because this is the trumpet sound going out to gather these. Now, many refuse the trumpet call. So the formalization of that is December 6th. And, of course, we know the symbol that's there is... Um, it's the, the 126 shekels, right? And the 2520. Exactly. So I'm just going to get rid of this part. Right, so you can see that symbol there. Now, the verse that we have to use for this, though, that's where we still have to address that. Now, we're saying that this is going to be shown in Chapter 7, okay? So when you go to Chapter 7, and I'll share the screen here. Because we now we get Jeroboam, who is his Gideon. So, so we know that it has to do with uh, Jeroboam. So we're going to just... Say that there's chapter seven is mentioned here, but but this story that we have of Gideon's three hundred men, this isn't really being addressed in this line, though to some degree it is, right? Because you do have a separation that occurs at December six, twenty twenty, right? And this is describing a separation. Now, Jeff has placed the 300 who give the proclamation. So he puts the 300 basically back to November 9th. They're going to be the ones who give this proclamation. So, but we can use this symbol again here in this story. So, so you can just say that all of chapter 7 addressing this separation is here. But we would just say, like, 7 verse 1, whether we want to go through and just say all of these verses that address going up to the 300. Um, so 7 verse 1 to 8. Right. Does that seem reasonable to just take that part of this that chapter and just place it here? Now, we could take the 1 to 8 as 18. So if, if we took that, 7 verse 1 to 8, 
that equals 126, right? So can we see how the story from Judges 7, verse 1 to 8 also gives us the July 18, right? And we know July 18, 7 times 18 is 126. So is that reasonable to take a span of verses? Because you could sort of say it's arbitrary. But here it's not. At least I don't think it is. I mean, somebody could say we could end it earlier, right? So you could say, well, maybe it's it's verse 7. But, but now you can see he retained those 300 men. So, so that's what we see here happening on December 6th. Can we see that the 300 men are retained? All right. Okay. So, it, it, so I don't think it's arbitrary in just choosing those verses. And I didn't choose them because of, you know, I could take seven times eighteen, um, and get one twenty-six. But I just noticed it after I chose them because, and I chose them based upon the content of those verses. So that's what we have now. We have these symbols connected to December 26th. The separation, the 300 being retained. And, and we can look at this line as a whittling down, just as we see in Millerite history. So we know in Millerite history uh, that there's going to be uh, this whittling down. You know, different numbers are given 300,000. But I, I like the 500,000 Millerites. Um, at to 50,000 and then down to 50 that happens, right? <clears throat> and so we know in, in Millerite history, you have the second angel arrive, the end of Miller's prediction. And obviously everybody doesn't just leave that day. It is a disappointment. But they already have this, this idea that maybe this is going to be extended. There's some kind of tearing time. But lots of people, the vast majority of people, aren't going to be with that movement. Um, but it's going to take a bit of time, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't whittle, whittle away all in one day. I mean, October 22 is going to be a little more dramatic than, you know, April 19th. And, and there was all these sort of disappointments, you know, uh, January 1st, 1843, the spring of 1843, the fall of 1843, uh, January 1st, 1844, you know, the spring, March 21st, April 19th, right? All of these are sort of disappointments. It happens progressively. Different people are going to become discouraged because they expected the event to happen sooner. And there's a cross involved with it, especially as... Um, the popular press, the churches, turn against the Millerite message. So in this movement, we have this separation here that would just illustrate uh, a separation that happens in Millerite history. So it's not going to line up with, let's say, midnight in Millerite history. It's not going to line up with Boston. But it, it just lines up with something within those lines as far as people uh, leaving the Millerite movement, we can see there's a parallel there. So it, it could be just Miller's first prophecy in some way, you know, 1843. Now, then we're going to have um, December 25th, 2020. Now, this is the empowerment of this message. Yeah, 12 times 25 is 300, Iran says. And 20... Uh, so 20, 20, 20, 20 times 300 is um, 
606,000. Okay, that's interesting. But yeah, definitely the, the, 25, uh, the 25 times 12. Uh, that's going to be over here, right? So um, right here, you're going to have this 25 times 12. So now we're, we, we put the 300 over on December 6th. They're going to be retained. But it's going to be the 300 that have this victory, right? So we can see that this is part of that sorting out of the people who are accepting the message. Because those who um, accepted December 6th and cut themselves off from the movement, are they even going to care about December 25th, 2020? So, so this is going to relate to um, to this way mark. And we also have December 25th over here in 2021 as well. Now, as far as the verses here, so we don't have a verse here yet. Um, <clears throat> now we, we had gone to chapter 8 for this. Now, when we look at chapter 8, uh, we have the men of Ephraim. So, so we're marking this December 25th, 2020, um, I don't know what, what we should do there. Because normally I would put the men of Ephraim, where would we put the men of Ephraim in this line? Okay, so are we going to put that December 25th, 2021? Isn't that what we've already done? Well, we, we've talked about it. We're, we're, we're trying to decide finally where we put it. Okay. So, so if we're going to take this one, uh, ver the, the empowerment of the second angel, we have December 25th, 2020. Now, we're going to have this, the men of Ephraim, that's going to be demonstrated at the end of the uh, 777 days. That's going to be demonstrated there, I think. So where what do we have then for here? We we can't just put the men of Eve. What 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 verse represents this um, December twenty fifth, twenty twenty? Because if we go here, like we we talked about, of course they're separating out this number. I mean. We could put this as this this Nashville prediction is being fulfilled here, but there's lots in this story here. You know, there's the dream. Um, you know, when they go down and they spy out the camp, um, and the basically the prophecy that's given. But you know, we put those in other lines uh, relating to this. But you know, he dreamed a dream, right? And this barley bread tumbling into uh, uh, into the host of Midian, this cake of barley bread. Now there's going to be the dividing of the three men into three companies. Um, could we, you know, and that almost to me, you could almost put it December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one, but, but. I think what we, we probably do have to put it at December 25th, 2020, because after FAFA gives their declaration, what ends up happening to this movement?
Because before we have Arkansas as the center, right? Correct. So, so when we're shut out from communication with FFA, uh, what happens to the move? Is, is it broken into three companies? That's an interesting parallel that I hadn't considered. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that happens on December 25th, 2020. I, I, and I'd have to go back and look at, at, at how that occurs. But, you know, the Canadian group had been doing studies, um, but the, the, the American group didn't exist as such, right? Correct. While it was going on. Um, Canadian group was, you know, doing Sabbath mornings. Um, and then I was doing studies because um, we were studying all this material, right? Um, before July 18th and after July 18th. Well, some of those studies, of course, went on well before July 18th as well. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So before July 18th, we started in, in April. I mean, the first study I did was March 27th, but um, that was related to the pandemic. And then we we started doing regular, and I was doing studies before that I wasn't recording. I was having Friday night studies. But I'm I'm thinking more back to the, the studies in Ezekiel. Yeah, so the studies in Ezekiel we do after July 18th. No, did we start those before July 18th? Yes, we did. Okay. Well before. Okay. Um, I'd have to look back at those. I know we did 105 studies. Right. Let me see here. The playlists. Um, Yeah, those are going to start on. Um, uh, so those start, so they end on February 1st, 2021. Um, but they we begin that on August 23rd, 2020. So it's, it's after July 18th. Because prior to July 18th, we were doing like really long studies. Um, three-hour studies, basically. I'm I'm just remembering studies that we were doing because my first time to Arkansas was way before July 18th. Okay, but yeah, we were doing other studies, so we had a whole other series of studies uh, before that because we were going through all of the different. Um, um, you know, different topics, the chronology of Ezekiel, uh, that, that we went through, uh, let me see what else, um, Leviticus 26 in the book of Daniel, the prophecies of Josiah, the structure of prophetic chronology, uh, and then we, then we did the studies in Esther, and those are going to start in November. So those are going to be after later on. Okay. So <clears throat> the Esther ones are going to start March 21st, 2021. No, they're going to end March 20. They're going to start in 2020, November 29. Anyway, the point is we have all of these different studies um, uh, that we did previously. But now we're saying that that we have these groups. So is the 300 divided into three different groups? Yes. Okay. So now all of those are given light. So so there is this 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 end of the 777 days. That's going to be December 25th, 2021. And you know, we have light 
Um, and, and the groups aren't always so well defined. I mean, we talk, talked about the American Canadian and, and, and my group, and, and those groups overlap. People go to all the different studies. Some people go to every every study. Um, but the point there is there is a different, um, um, I'm going to use the word temperament, uh, you know, different a different sense in the different types of studies of, of how we're approaching things. You know, and I know Stephen's done, done studies over in the UK as well. Uh, we don't usually know about his studies too much. They're not all posted on YouTube or anything. But he studies with people online and in person sometimes. But, um, you know, we can say that the, that the group is sort of divided at that point. Right, those that went through July 18th and then went through this rejection of FFA, uh, they're there. Um, in and, and so that's going to be after December 6th that we're going to have then these three groups form. So if, if that's the case, and we're going to take these verses, I mean, that would be Judges 7.16. Now here also they're going to have this um, blowing of the trumpet again in 7.18. Now in other lines, we put 7.18 as July 18, right? So the message of Gideon is meant to, because in this 300, you have three companies. He put a trumpet in every man's hand and empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. Now, did God do that for us with the bombing of Nashville on December 25th, 2020? Uh, 20, 20, December 25th, 2020. Do we have then... Um, Is that the 300 divided into three camps? <clears throat> and would we use these verses? Any thoughts regarding these verses and placing them there? Now, uh, we have verses 16 to 18. Of course, that's 1618. Um, whether that's just arbitrary there. So are we okay with this? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to start here with 8 verse 1. So I'm going to assume the silence means people agree. But if you don't, let me know. So you have that whole section dealing with it. We're just choosing the, the 300 blowing the trumpets. We're not going through the whole battle there. And then we go to chapter 8. This is going to be the men of Ephraim. 
and their complaint. Now, that definitely goes at December 25th, 2021. I mean, we know that. Now, we also have the 300 men still there with Gideon. So we would say it's eight, verse one to four. Okay, right? That's gonna be the men of Ephraim complaining. They weren't called. And then of course we can see the 25 times 12 again. The 300 are still there, right? They're still pursuing uh, Zeb and Zalmunna. They're faint yet pursuing. Any thoughts about this? <clears throat> Is there more information that we need? I would think that there's some that we're going to need, yes. Okay, so what do we need? What, what do we need to, to help us with this? So, so we have these verses. We're saying that this is Jeroboam. We know that right. this is <clears throat> FFA, FFA being tested and then the remnant or the refuse of FFA being tested. The outcasts, uh, they're being tested. And, and they're given this message. So that message that, that we're applying here in this context, in this line, of that they're, they're going to be separated out this 300. They're going to have this um, in verse 16 and 18. That's where they're going to be separated out after December 6th. And then they're going to blow their trumpets. So, so we have all of this. We have this Jeroboam issue addressed. And now the one thing that we have here with this Jeroboam is, I mean, he's going to be mentioned in um, chapter seven. Now in chapter eight is we have the death of Jeroboam, right? which is going to be called the death of Gideon in my subheading. But so it says that Jeroboam, the son of Josh, went and dwelt in his own house, and Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. Now, we can see how this is all going to relate, because we've gone through this many times. Um, but we can see that the death of Gideon is occurring in this arrival of the fourth, fourth angel. Now, we don't address in this one uh, the ephod because we address that as a separate line. But in some ways, that's actually a zoom into this line or to this way mark of this line. Correct. But, yeah. So. Um, but in this death of Gideon, because this is a message, um, this is a message that does a particular work in this movement. And after January 11th, 2023, we, we have another message that comes to this movement, right? Which we're gonna have to address uh, next week. So, I mean, it, I mean, we've gone over this a few times. We can see how this fits. We can now have some of these verses. We need to have some more details added here, more explanation. 
and you know if somebody's willing to to do some of that or ask some of the questions of things that they need explained on this chart um that would be fine Any other thoughts before we close with prayer? None that I can completely express yet. Okay. Yeah, there's there's lots of thoughts that go through my mind as we look at these. Particularly in relationship to how, how we discern these different lines or threads. You know, how they're woven together. I mean, because this there's just so much imagery in in these structures. You know, I got some questions too, but I'd rather wait mm -hmm. I ain't driving or ask the hospital. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so these questions, some of them we can address on Sunday. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this day and for the study and for the people that have attended. We ask that you can bless them and those that watch these videos later. Lord, we need your presence in our lives. We need to see ourselves as we truly are. And we know, Lord, that um, it's so easy to see the sins of others, but to ignore uh, the obvious sins in our own lives so we ask for forgiveness and that we can pray and encourage one another and um, we ask that you can watch over each person today and bring us together again to study your word we pray in jesus name amen